as you see, it's amateur radio's next generation. I didn't have enough room for generation. And these are pictures that I've collected over the years, and some of them I just Googled of all young amateurs enjoying the hobby um, and having a lot of fun. This isn't um, designed to be like a youth forum. It's more like I'm trying to talk out to all of the older people and the older generation, the, you know, baby boomers and Generation X and, you know, late or I guess early millennials so that um, we can proceed with amateur radio's future because right now as we're sitting there's, you know, a lot of hams checking out. So I'm looking at the stream and it looks good. Good. All right. Where's the clicker? Here's the clicker. All right, so here's me, um, and this is a testimony of basically what ham radio has gotten me in my life. In the beginning, uh, I started a YouTube channel. I got into ham radio basically because I was interested in walkie-talkies, um, and a lot of people nowadays have just like taken walkie-talkies like FRS and CB radio and moved into the ham radio world. So like at five years old, I would um, learn, I would use... Um, like HTs, or I, I would use um, um, like toy walkie-talkies my dad bought from, uh, you know, a toy store. And I would never stop talking to him over that walkie-talkie. In fact, I wouldn't talk to him without the walkie-talkie. And I'd go down the street, I'd go down the block, and I'd try to get as much range out of it, because I was just so fascinated at this magic. So after getting into CB radio, I met a friend in high school who was into um, ham radio, who was getting his license. And that's where I got inspired. I met with the Washington Amateur Radio Club here in Washington, Missouri. They gave me my technician test and had my first field day in 2007. From that point, I was bitten by the bug, as they say. I started a YouTube channel, and then I started writing for the ARRL as a youth editor. The ham radio experience led to my college decision at Missouri S&T. Uh, and Missouri S&T is home of um, W0 Triple E, and this is the check as it was um, you know, a few weeks ago before the fire happened uh, at Rolla at the Emerson Hall. So all the shack is is now gutted, but they're remodeling it. We actually have the whole contention of W0 AAA in the room with us today, so that's really great. The, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, is that, is that the EE building? Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, the EE building caught fire, the, the roof did, so they're remodeling the whole thing now. It didn't burn down, luckily, so. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people would have rather. So, at s and I was on a rover team and where we built a rover that was basically capable of traversing on Mars. It probably wouldn't have worked in the atmosphere so well, but it was a huge learning experience into like electrical design, network design, um, doing like, and I was like a ham radio guy, so I was like writing the, the path loss models, I was using SPLAT and other tools to like measure how far we can make the rover go from the base station and where we can so that we have line of sight and that sort of stuff. Um, I worked at the very large array, you see in the background, and then um, uh, I got a job with Boeing in St. Louis on the F-15 communication systems team. Um, I've been to Yoda Camp in Austria, and that's, uh, we'll talk about that, but that's a huge gathering of young hams in um, uh, IRAU Region 1, which is Europe and Africa, um, who um, promotes youth and do a yearly camp. So we'll talk about that. So that's kind of my story. And I want to be able to give ham radio as a prescription to all the youth out here to be able to follow in those footsteps to either get a career, have a really you know fruitful life, um, and also vice versa, getting more youth into ham radio from you know our perspective as Elmers. So the real issue here is the high rate of attrition versus the low rate of youth entry into the hobby. There's tons and tons of um, you know, licenses every day, but a lot of those licenses are inactive. You have an aging population with the silent generation approaching their finality, um, and those guys are from like radio men from the Army, and um, the in introduction of commercial revival radios like Heath Kidd, Swan, Drake, that sort of stuff. And then 80-90% of baby boomers will be SK in the next 25 years, and those guys are from CB, car phone, auto patch, um, Korean veteran war, uh, Korean and uh, Vietnam war era. So that's where, that's like the source of all the hams right now, like the majority. Nowadays with the millennials, most hams are either in, in, into income um, or they have scouting interest or the most common thing I hear is that my dad was a ham and they just, people just got interested uh, from that. 
So at this point, though, ham radio the technology has been surpassed by the internet. So now you can communicate around the world using Skype. Um, and that's even more um, important for Generation Z, which is after the millennial, people are being born now and into the you know, next couple of years. They're born in the internet and raised on the internet. So we need to think of ways to bring the internet into ham radio and ham radio into the internet and kind of mesh these two things uh, to see like, where we can meet. You know? So I've been listening to this podcast, and I met this guy, Brooke Allen, in 2BA. And um, he's written for the National Contest Journal, and he has a really, really unique perspective on the future of ham radio and using game theory to make uh, ham radio really fun. Game theory is basically the idea of getting yourself into a state of flow where you are very like, invested and interested in what you're doing, but not too bored and not too stressed out. It's like this perfect state like where you're playing a video game and you're just getting to level up, level up, level up, and finally you level up, and then you're like back down and you're you know, working up. And so I'll show you a picture in a minute. But the way I see it at the top level, so for example, the AWRL, or IRU, or like large regional amateur radio clubs, they're the guys who need to generate think tanks to figure out how to gamify ham radio, make contesting more rewarding, uh, more incentivization, more marketing towards young people and colleges and schools, and uh, promoting education, in incentivization by scholarships. Uh, and we'll talk about that. And then continuing the development on. Um, and then at the lower level, where I'm trying to get at, at this, with this talk, is things like the SLSRC and you as a Elmer or a person is to facilitate, like, generate a one-on-one -on -one connection with a young person or a group of young people. Facilitating an emotional engagement will help, um, will, will really seat that. That's basically me going to field day and sitting behind a radio and hearing all these tons and tons of hundreds and hundreds of voices and figuring out how to um, operate the radios and then make contacts and log them and all that. It was all really high stress, but it was also really rewarding because I was hearing states, countries far away from here, which was just like really magic to me. From that thoughtful amoring and you know going through the licensing process very patiently and following up and not letting go of like whoever you helped, because then you can see and, and try to set the hook um, in the future so that they don't just like you know run away and do some other fun stuff, right? <laughs> we want to keep. Them. So on the emotional connection side, I'll talk about this. Bewilderment plus fascination equals, or plus applicability equals captivation. And by applicability, I mean how is ham radio applicable to what a young person is doing? So what I mean by that is think of contesting, for example. Contesting is a game, and it can be very um, accessible and applicable to a young person based on the skill level of that person and how hard it is to operate the station. So what I'm kind of envisioning is easier ways to operate a station so that young people can contest easier and also different contest categories and systems and um, things that we're not used to but need to think up of to um, gamify, like I was saying earlier. And there's this uh, anecdote I want to talk. Brooke Allen mentioned this, and this is what I said earlier in the contest, National Contest Journal. His son and uh, himself are going to a, a science conference, and they had a decision between taking his car, Brooke's car, or his son's car. And so they were like, hey, um, which car should we take? Well, we should take my car. I have VoIP, I have Skype, you know, I, I can like do anything anywhere. If we get you know, stuck on the side of the road, I can hail a taxi from 100 miles away in a lickety split. Brooke's like, well, why don't we take my car? And he's like, why, his son? Um, well, I have a box under my seat that's full of magic. This box is connected with a wire to a piece of metal on the back of my car. And the box is also connected to a microphone, which takes the sound particle, the sound waves from my voice, and converts those into magic, <laughs> and then sends that magic out over this piece of wire, which sends that signal all the way around the world. Hum, uh, maybe even a dozen times, where you can hear other magicians or other magicians with these magic sticks and magic boxes can pick up this infinitesimally small signal that has traveled thousands of miles, amplify it, and hear it through a speaker. There's no infrastructure, there's no Skype, there's no data plane, it's all free, you know, and I've worked this up over, you know, the, the course of however long it takes you to build a station, and it's just really cool. And so the kid's like, well, why would I want to do that? 
because it's freaking magic. And so he was like, okay, fine, we'll take the car. Um, we'll take your car and play with this ham radio thing. And so they did. They, they contacted stations from Argentina, Antarctica, um, Colombia, Europe, England, that sort of stuff. And, the, and that's when it immediately became real, real, realized where you can't use Skype to just talk to random people. And sometimes it's not even about talking to random people. It's just about the idea of it, the challenge of it. It's not always there. It's propagation. It's here or there. Um, and it's maybe not here. There's a solar flare and it's not there. That challenge is really, really interesting and that causes a state where you can get into flow. And so with that said, making it easy and making it rewarding um, in terms of ham radio with for to a young person is like a thing to think about in how to introduce people to ham radio and young people to ham radio. So, <clears throat> so I mentioned a while back gamification of ham radio. In this picture you can see that starting from the bottom left corner um, is like when you start a game, a video game. You go up and you're, and you're playing, you get into this bored state, but then suddenly you level up and you're faced with a whole new set of enemies, a whole new set of challenges and objectives. And so while you're leveling up, you're, you get into flow in this white channel, it's called the flow channel. You keep doing that and doing that, but it gets really hard and more challenging just right till the very end when you're in um, a state of stress, just, just before you get like anxiety and you're just kind of you know, pushed away from doing it, you level up again. Um, or I had that wrong. This is like this is where you're like leveling up, leveling up, and then over here where you're done with it and you're bored with it and you figured out how to play the game, you're bored, but then suddenly you level up and you're back into the whole thing of starting over and being challenged and being in that state of flow. So this state of flow is really, really engaging to people because it's like a, a very fundamental um, way humans think. Uh, it's intrinsically rewarding. Even though it's a video game on a screen, you're still being rewarded with this little <laughs> nugget of coin or you know, a, a thing that you found on a quest. Um, in ham radio, you're rewarded with North Carolina and Alaska. And these might not sound so cool, but like at the end of the day, when you're like trying to make 83, get, get contacts from all 83 of these sections, and I'm alluding to sweepstakes, um, but you don't necessarily need to know what I'm talking about. It's the same thing. So we're here competing with those games, and we have a very easy way to do that with contesting and, and other methods like you know, contacting and that sort of stuff I'll talk about in a minute. And it's just intrinsically rewarding. So we need to think of ways to make contests more rewarding that follow this flow diagram. Contests right now are very long term. Um, there's some sprints that are like four hours, but um, um, they're not so like publicized as compared to like sweepstakes where you have to sit down behind a radio for like 24 hours. So there's got to be new ways to do this and think about this. And then showing peer interest. So things for like, like Yoda or Yacht or Bark Jr. and I'll talk about those in a minute. They use modern uh, tools like social media and gatherings to make everybody, you know, make, make it show, show that, you know, young people are also part of this hobby too. Young people come in and they see that everybody's old and they get afraid and they leave. But if you can show them all of the resources that are actually out there, which believe it or not, there are so many young people in ham radio, then that really you know, sets the hook. Live streaming is something I'm doing right now and I'm trying to promote contest, live, streaming, uh, live stream contesting and live scoring uh, because that's using a modern tool for um, um, antiquated, you know, I forget the word that uh, Brooke uses, but an old technology. Um, that's starting to see its like you know age, and if you watch, if you listen to Bob Hiles' um, presentation, um, this totally flips ham radio upside down in the in the scheme that you can't learn anything on ham radio. He says, and you can't like just talk to somebody. It's all contesting now. That might be the case, you know, for engaging more young people. Um, and and I do kind of have a spin on contesting because it's mostly it's like very applicable to the, to the game theory, but there's other ways to do it. So what has been working? Where are those young people hanging out? Young Amateurs Communication Ham Team or Yacht is a uh, online you know, group of hams. They have a Facebook now and these yellow links, I'll have this on my website. You can click on them and find the um, um, information. The, y the Yacht is a group of I think 50 to 100, I think there might be even 200 young people licensed and signed up 
um, from all over the world who um, participate in nets. They have a weekly net, they have HF nets. They've been doing things off and on for you know, several years, I think 10 or 12 years or so. Um, Ed Engelman will correct me if I'm wrong. You have Bark Junior, which is the Boulder, Boulder Amateur Radio Club Junior section. And this is a, um, you know, a group of people led by uh, teachers who um, have a surprising number of very intelligent hams come out of the woodwork and come out like uh, Skylar Fennell, KD0WHB or HWB, I think it's WHB. He won the um, a Young Ham of the Year Award this year, and he's from Bark Jr., and a couple other members of Bark Jr. have won. AWRL Foundation Scholarships um, are also very excellent. They you know, give away many tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships funded by you know, um, uh, generous donors through the AWRL and the Foundation of Amateur Radio, um, as well as you know, the ASME. And then uh, Youngsters on the Air, and this is something we haven't seen in the US. It's a, it's a Yoda Region 1 Europe and Africa thing um, where it started, and I'll mention, I'll talk about it in a minute but it's a consortium of a lot of young hams in the highest level of amateur radio bureaucracy. So that might sound like really like scary, but it's actually really good because you have somebody at the top who is really good for you. In general, youth go where the youth are. So here's where all the youth are. We need to get the word out that these are here and that more are coming um, to bring more uh, into the hobby. And here's some things that I've found that doesn't really work. Um, if you go to a, a meeting, um, and you ask, like, how do we get more youth involved? You'll hear things like, well, we need to promote more digital modes and PSK31, and uh, well, kids like CW, but believe it or not, like, you can promote all you want, but you need to show it. You need to demonstrate. You need to, like, have a catch, you know, and you can't just say, like, hey, kids, PSK31 lets you use your computer. And it's like, well, I have Skype for that. So you always have to have kind of like a comeback, a, a magic story, so if you, if you will. Pasting flyers for field day in your area schools also doesn't work because you'll walk up to your bulletin board and see field day and you're like, oh, and you won't even know what it is. So, um, and forgetting that you're talking to an audience that has a ton of competing interests. Um, as a young person, you're in high school, you have girls and boys and football and band camp and that sort of stuff competing with, you know, this ham radio thing. So you got to remember not to, um, yeah, don't worry if you're not getting every single young person interested. You know, because some people will become football players, and some people will become electrical engineers, and some will do other things. So, so I'll go through like different ideas for the different like age groups, and I'll start at like pre-high school, like more like middle school, I should say, um, because beyond that, you know, you don't want to like interfere too much. But there's there's some exclusions, like the Hope Lee family, or the uh, the Lee family, and Hope Lee is one of them, and I, I for always forget the names of a couple other. There's some. There are a whole family of hands that are like very very successful in uh, using ham radio and homeschooling and all of this to, to make um, a very, very awesome contingent of like a couple young hands and they're inspiring like tons and tons of people. So that's been really good. Um, but for the general population, kids who go to school, public school, it's technically challenging to create interest um, in young people at this age because it requires a lot of elmering and facilitation. Um, hand, like kids at that age are not seeking you know, hobbies. Um, it's easier to do, um, to connect science theory, things like the atmosphere, the ionosphere, using amateur radio as a tool to demonstrate that there is a, you know, this thing around the globe that reflects radio waves. Um, and then scouting. Scouting starts at around this age and that's been a really solid uh, thing for ham radio. And I have Morse code up here because imagine like a lot of young people this age learn Morse code to transfer secret messages. But what if you got somebody who learned Morse code and then showed them uh, the CW band during the AWRL DX CW contest. Like, it would probably, I feel like that would be a mind blowing experience. So, I'll talk about scouting. It's been, I don't have much to say about it, just that it's been really um, active and successful on amateur radio. Every year they have Jamboree on the air, um, which this year some million, million uh, young people were exposed to ham radio during Jamboree, and that's worldwide. Um, so, that's something to keep up, and it's really good to leverage the ideas from the Boy Scouts. Uh, and the scouting agencies across the world, um, how they've been doing ham radio, um, and how they've been like, you know, they have a patch. So there's an incentive, there's a reward. If you learn ham radio, you know, get your license, you get a patch. That right there is gamification. You get a reward for, you know, doing something difficult. <coughs> now in high school, this is where competing interests like girls, boys, band, that sort of stuff comes in. 
So, but this is also where those competing interests are all laid down on the table. So you have like FCCLA, FAA, F, or FBA, like all these, you know, three, four letter acronyms for all of the like debate team, band, football. Ham radio clubs are also can be a part of that. But not just that, think about first robotics. Um, every robot, if it's not connected to a wire, has a wireless router on it. And um, ham radio has a ton of resources and expertise and uh, materials for connecting robots to, you know, the Ethernet or to the uh, to the ether um, using radio waves. Um, and that's how that's kind of my analog to um, Mars rover, where we where I talked earlier about how I got into Mars rover. Um, competitive ham radio teams. I would like love to see this because in Europe there's a ton of youth teams that are that are basically contesters. Um, and as well as orienteering, um, basically doing a amateur radio direction finding in a um, um, in a competitive sense where you have like maybe 50 participants and five beacons on a map. They're unmarked. There's like a probably a radius that shows where these beacons are, um, but you have to go find them and use amateur radio direction finding techniques to locate them like precisely so that you can punch a card and then run off to the next one. High altitude ballooning is also really strong too. It's a it's a really fun thing to do. Um, that's that's gets a lot of news coverage, gets a lot of you know interest generated in the media and populace, and also has that ham radio part. Can you go ahead and hit Control Shift G again. Hopefully, I'll switch over. And college is a is a big, big, big potential part. I'm like checking the stream again of uh, amateur radio. Yeah, go ahead and alt tab to the, uh, there we go, good. College has a massive potential of, of amateurs, C word. Um, because you have, again, those competing interests and a lot of basically a fresh slate of what do I want to do now? Do I want to join student council? Do I want to do electrical engineering? Do I want to do um, theater? Well, at W0 Triple E, for example, we had a ham radio club and a huge tower and a huge room and a whole bunch of equipment. And basically, that's why I went to s and because they had that. And it was also an engineering school, and that's something I wanted to get into because engineering is a really good you know, thing. <coughs> My dad said that would be a good thing to do, so I did. <coughs> and that turned out to be very, very strong. Um, in college, rivalry promotes competition. So um, just this last year, in 2016, K0D is a special event, Kicking Out Depression. And it was Texas University of Texas and Texas Tech who competed to make the most contacts on this special event. That created a huge, a huge amount of interest. They got on all the podcasts, all the live shows, um, and promoted the and, and promoted uh, PTSD um, awareness. And they, they generated a lot of money. Uh, I think this year they're kind of having trouble keeping up with it, but uh, we'll see how they work in the future. It's also very relevant to EE coursework, and I should also mention STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and it's not just relevant to EE, it's relevant to you know, English and history and geography and, and all these other you know, divisions of, of courses. It allows for a lot of easy networking for future careers. So these two bullets here kind of combine easy networking and career implications. Because when I got my internship, I was contacted at the very large array, this big radio observatory in New Mexico um, that basically makes all the pictures of galaxies that you see that aren't um, in the visual, that aren't captured by Hubble. And they contacted me because I had ham radio listed on my resume. And all this like W0 Triple E repeater experience, building some antennas here and there, just for fun. And nothing I did, in, in nothing I did at college was actually relevant to that internship where I was basically an RF engineer. I would walk around with a spectrum analyzer looking for people with cell phones, because those cell phones would interfere with the science, basically. Think of it, if you had a cell phone on the moon, if you, went, if you took your cell phone, you're up on the moon, you try to make a call, and all the VLA dishes, and this is like 28 dishes pointed at um, the moon over a 13 mile area, it's massive, the, the whole VLA would break. <laughs> so imagine now that phone, 186 mi 186,000 miles away, or give or take, I forget how exactly far, on site. Like, once you have phones on site, their, their harmonics spread all over the place, and now all the science is messed up. So you don't get any pretty pictures of black holes and galaxies. So that was my job, is to find people with cell phones using little direction-finding things 
and that would beep whenever I got close to somebody with a cell phone, and they'd be like, oh, am I getting irradiated? Is that going to give me cancer? And I'll be like, the cell phone might, but I'm not. <laughs> so um, Bob Heil and his thing mentioned uh, the new CEO, um, um, Tom Gallagher, um, in Y2RF of the ARRL. He recognizes this you know, loss of amateur radio youth, or lack of amateur radio youth, and he's helping start the Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative, which me, Sam Rose, um, Scott Westerman are a part of, uh, W9WSW, I think, and he's at Michigan State, to develop ham radio in the college scene. Um, we don't really know what this is. This could be, you know, just a lot of promotional stuff. Um, basically, right now, it's a Facebook page. If you go to facebook.com slash A-R-R-L-C-A-R-I, if you click the link, you can go to it. Um, it's just all college hams um, and alumni there. Uh, promoting, making contacts, and, and doing this sort of thing. So hopefully sooner there'll be some mesh of, of um, cool stuff. Sam Rose made a um, KC2LRC, who's also in the carry program, made a presentation at the Dayton Instructors Forum, Advantages of College Ham Radio Clubs. There's a pres presentation on YouTube, and I have the slides on my website. So on the, on the link here, you can find that. But college... We need to do more in, in colleges and engineering and not just engineering. Truman State University used to have a ham radio club and they're a liberal school, a liberal arts school. Washington University in St. Louis has a ham radio club as well, still with an antenna, but it's just gone defunct. SLU is doing a satellite team. They have ham radio station up on their, their top floor, uh, St. Louis University, um, and they're, they're trying to build a satellite and using amateur radio to run telemetry and command to the satellite. So there's a lot of unopened potential for amateur radio in colleges. And after college, um, there are a lot of employer amateur radio associations. I just did a quick Google, found Motorola, Boeing, TRW, uh, aerospace company in California, Rockwell Collins, they make radios in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Disney, Compact, RCA, and various broadcaster societies all have ham radio clubs, and they're active, give or take. Um, but most of them are mostly retirees, and some of them are retirees only. And this is like kind of disturbing to, uh, to me and the you know, young people of amateur radio because, you know, what are you doing to promote the hobby to the future? What are you doing to, you know, progress the hobby? And, you know, some people aren't so progressive after all, but, but still, you got to ask the question. So what can your company's club do to get your membership? Um, in within your company, um, and this is directed at you know all these guys up here who need more members and more young members. Get the word out through internal and, and external social media, flyers on bulletin boards, emails to um, you know various interest groups. Almost every company has different interest groups. And don't expect attendance at meetings. Um, this this just applies for everybody. Don't expect attendance at meetings by young people because meetings aren't interesting. Think doing stuff is interesting. So. Keep everyone well informed of what happens at the meeting. Um, have minutes and have an agenda and maybe you know, live stream if you can or record it um, to keep everyone informed of what's going on. And that will also generate some more interest to get into the meetings because then people will be like, oh, I want to do that. I want to be involved in that. Uh, and don't, ex uh, don't expect everyone that reads your website either. So use email to generate, you know, to, to actually notify people on the spot. And don't and and, uh, and design youthful activities um, like contesting, um, have a contest club, or do radio direction finding stuff that gets people out and active. Works for everybody, but also especially <coughs> for younger people um, in the post college, you know, younger adult. Like I'm 25 years old, so this is like where I'm at right now. <coughs> so I'll talk about youngsters on the air. In 2016, in June, I went to Austria or July winner of the two. And I met 110 people from around the world, mostly from Europe and Africa, who are incredible hams. Like they're people who can do 60 words per minute CW while having a conversation with you and drinking a coffee in the other hand. There are people there who sat behind a radio and made tens of hundreds of contacts, you know, over, over the course of a few hours, like really, really fast because they had the station here set up. And then there's like girls, like there were about 25 to 30% female there, which was really impressive. Um, and from that, there were relationships generated, which is really surprising. Um, there was a lot of activities where we could um, just socialize. And then there was also a lot of 
um, antenna building and high altitude ballooning and doing stuff with DMR and that sort of stuff. So Yelda starts at the top. IRA Region 1 has a youth working group and it's got 26 or so young hams from the Region 1 countries and that's everything in Europe like U the UK, France, Belgium, Netherlands, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And it goes down into Africa as well. And they run a few things. One of them I was just talking about is Yoda Camp, and the other thing is December Youth Month, which is a QSO party for a whole month. They use um, Yoda call signs, so OE2YOTA will be a station in, um, I think it's Austria, I forget the prefix, um, that young people can go to, or you can use that call sign at any other station in the country, and you're trying to generate calls for your country, for your member society is what they call them. And whoever wins gets, you know, trophies and, you know, uh, bragging rights. You can say, I have the best, you know, most contacts. And it's also down to an individual level um, as well, uh, not just the country level. I think last year Germany uh, had it in the bag by a pretty high margin. And if I'm wrong, somebody's going to, like, text me in three seconds. <laughs> um, so we want to do this in the U.S. This is only in Europe, so we want to bring this over to the U.S. And the reason why I went to Yoda Camp was because Ward Silver and Glenn Johnson, the N0AX and W0GJ of Yasme and NC North Carolina DX Foundation, oh, North Carolina, North California DX Foundation, recognized an interest, recognized, I noticed that Yoda was happening and they wanted to have people from the US go and fact find and bring it to the US so we can do this too, because it's so much fun. Um, so Sam and I are leading this kind of initiative Right now we're overpaid and underworked, so, or, um, uh, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. We're overworked and underpaid. I wish I was overpaid and underworked. And so we need help from guys like the AWRL, guys like um, Yasme and CDXF, and then radio clubs like SLSRC, and bigger and, and, and even smaller, down to you know the individual person just you know donating or sponsoring something or having equipment available. These are the activities that we're thinking of Doing and these are the venues. The Voice of America Museum was given to me by Neil Rapp and um, um, Joyce Jocelyn Brault, who run it. The VOA Museum in Cleveland or Cincinnati, it's somewhere in Ohio. Uh, contest superstations are also a good thing too, like K3LR or K9CT, who have like massive, massive multi-operator stations. So imagine you know a bunch of kids out there having a special event. But the other side of this is that there's not just ham radio activities, there's also non-ham radio events, like sightseeing, swimming, bowling, hiking. So the VOA would be good because there's Cleveland, there's a amusement park, things like DC or New York or Chicago where there's you know tons of things to do are also very ideal. But along with that, it's all the ham radio stuff, contesting, special event operating, direction finding, antenna building, mesh networking, APRS, these are blah, 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 blah. Especially straight SDR and doing stuff that aren't exactly ham radio aren't exactly talking on a radio we built a low pass filter and using a raspberry pi a whisper beacon and this was a literally a raspberry pi just plugging to the wall with a piece of code on it and a string of wire a piece of wire stuck into a port that was about you know 20 feet long this would emit a signal so robust so weak it was probably weaker than an led on your remote control uh it, it used less power than the energy contained in my voice, basically. It was a few milliwatts. And that signal could be heard around the world, like no problem. You could beacon for two minutes, and then all of a sudden you'd see on the web, on the internet, that 50 people heard your signal from, and this was in Austria, and we could get people from the UK, and Finland, and Australia, and the US, and that was really cool, a little raspberry Pi. Um, we also used that for DMR and VSTAR work, because it's a computer and it can uh, run as like a hotspot. Um, there are informationals on things like LTE, GSM, Wi-Fi, how that stuff works and you know how you can get into it. One really interesting thing is when they developed the iPhone 4, they had the antennas built on the outside and they, um, they realized their mistake because if you held it too tightly, the antennas would bridge. There were two antennas, two parts. The antennas would bridge and then they would have a high SWR, meaning your phone wouldn't work if you held it. So you had to like hold your phone like in a weird way, where you're like, hello, I have to hold my phone like this, or get a bumper. So it takes hands to know that. Um, and that's kind of the message here. So, conclusion, and I'm a little bit early on this, and it's probably you know great for everybody, because everybody wants to go home by now. 
To interest you, be passionate and be patient. Passionate people are inherently inspiring. I go to, I go to Hamvention because I want to listen to the people who are interesting and who are really, really into what they do because that's inspiring. Listening to podcasts like NCBA where they have these crazy ideas that it might just work, that's why I'm here because that keeps me interested. Always teach by doing and not showing. Don't just say, oh, we have PSK31 because nobody knows what that is. Show them that you can get on your computer and contact anybody in the world um, with using less power than a light bulb. Um, retaining and understand that all, not all youth are not future hands. Um, and you know, to retain youth, maintain the contact. Don't just you know, say, here's a flyer, get your license, and then leave. And cultivate youth-based ham radio groups um, as well as lead you know, young people to those groups and use good social media practices like I just mentioned and, you know, with Yacht and Bart Jr. and keeping things interesting. We need young people to have a future in ham radio and so hopefully this talk is the first of many. I know this one was pretty like all over the place but I really appreciate your time um, and also I appreciate your comments either here or on the web. I know there might be live comments but go ahead and comment on the YouTube channel and um, subscribe to N0SSC to get this and overall thank you. I have a website N0SSC.com which will have this slide and this recording and all of that. So any questions out there? Come on, I know you can have questions. All right, well with that said, I think I'm done with this and um, we can all go home. Thank you.